Welcome to the Stanford Lee Show. This episode, saxophone is the tongue of music. I think I got into uh, KISS in a really big way uh, later. Just exciting going through their repertoire of music. I remember this uh, one important job I had. I mean, not that I was goofing off the whole time, but what I miss about that job is this uh, um, archive of notes that I made while listening to their catalog from the beginning uh, past the 2000s. I would listen to Kiss and Slade. Why did I listen to those two together? I guess I kind of think of Slade as like the British counterpart to Kiss for some strange reason, but uh, I got really into drumming and listening to those bands are just kind of a foundation, just really exciting and, uh, you know, not full of crap. I mean, they're just really, you know, straight ahead songs and uh, flamboyance and all the things that we should love about rock and roll. And then uh, there's those albums, you know, that uh, are not so rock and roll. They kind of take a detour in an interesting way. And I found a lot of those, uh, you know, because we uh, listen to music kind of like one song at a time or scroll through, you know, the latest, greatest uh, stuff, you know, on Spotify or YouTube, wherever you get your music. And it's easy to miss some of those things because you don't have the history and context. And by going through a whole catalog of an artist, you get the history along with it. and. Kiss was no exception. What I really got fascinated by was particularly their, uh, their late 70s, late 70s music in which uh, the band was kind of breaking up and feuding, and they would bring in these really heavyweight producers. I don't mean fat, like, or, you know, uh, anything like that. I mean, they were big time producers to put everything together and kind of plan and you know, get their songs and material together and craft it a certain way. But with that, it brings the opportunity when you have a studio and that level of production that uh, has not been surpassed today, in my opinion, you have all those opportunities to make songs something more than rock, I guess, bring it to kind of a broader audience. I like the attempts at that because uh, it, uh, it crosses over, it becomes exciting. It's something that, uh, I would talk about with my friends and we would uh, have debates about which album's better and, you know, kind of have a friendly little scuffle about it. Usually I'm on the, you know, like, hey, I really like uh, I Was Made For Loving You and uh, somebody's going to be like, no, that song really sucks. It's horrible. And uh, Kiss didn't even like the song, but it was just totally commercial. <laughs> Dynasty, that's what I'm getting at. That was actually uh, my favorite Kiss album. In a way, it is, really, because it's just so over-the-top commercial that it's actually good and intriguing. It had uh, super talents like uh, Desmond Child. They brought him in as a songwriter. Uh, Vinny uh, Poncia as producer. And these... Uh, these songs that they were crafting at the time, think about Casablanca Records. I mean, they had like a, a lot of artists that were funk and R&B and uh, a lot of favorites. Um, you know, if I'm looking through a record collection, a lot of stuff that I recognize. So let me tell you what they thought of this album. I think that the band members really hated it. Paul Stanley says, well, I wanted to do something different, you know, something more modern and catchy. It was a huge hit, but some of our fans hated it because they didn't understand uh, that we were still a hard rock band at heart. Okay, so they're a hard rock band at heart. Uh, Gene Simmons, I hated it too. It was a sellout move by Paul and <laughs> Vinnie Poncia, who also produced the album. They tried to make us sound like the Bee Gees or something. They freaking tried to make them sound like the Bee Gees. Um, let's see. Let's see what Ace Freely says. I didn't care either way. I just wanted to play guitar and have fun. Uh, he's basically saying he doesn't give a. Uh, Peter Chris, I didn't play on most of the album. They replaced me with a session drummer called uh, Anton Fig because they said I wasn't good enough anymore. Okay, so I really wanted to um, take this in a different direction. I'm like. 
Why in the heck not put in some saxophone? I think that would really piss some people off, you know, because uh, this is sacred. This is rock and roll over here, and uh, pop music is over here. And uh, just as long as they stay in their own lane, you know, it's all cool. I mean, think of uh, several years ago when uh, that band, uh, they're another band that wear makeup, by the way, Ghost uh, had one of their uh, popes play saxophone. It's enough for a band to be sacrilegious. I mean, that's really disturbing in itself. But then, of all sacrilege to play a saxophone with heavy metal, it's just an abomination. But it's an abomination that needs to be explored. And I think in this album it almost was, but uh, you know, it never really happened. You can just feel it. You can feel the space in there where there was supposed to be a saxophone. What was I saying about saxophone being the tongue of music? Uh, that was a quote by Izzy Izzard, and I think it's true. And there's a, there's a lot of fire and a lot of genres that uh, KISS incorporates in their music that would be perfect with saxophone whether it's hard rock or whether it's something that, um, as Gene Simmons said, had a little more of a BG sound with the harmonies, you know, that late 70s kind of thing going on. So that would be fantastic. Uh, which song uh, would be perfect for that? My favorite song on that album is Sure Know Something. It just has uh, such a vibe. It, uh, I like the way the guitar comes in the drums, four on the floor, you hear Gene Simmons rattling bass, and it just has atmosphere, kind of those uh, smoky chords, almost like a, a jazz song, you know, with a little bit of uh, smokiness and uh, kind of a guitar, guitar sound that's somewhere in between rock and pop. And they do those great harmonies, I guess, that they were criticizing that sound kind of disco. And I'm just hearing it, I'm hearing it all over that that song, just an uh, incredible alto saxophone. I went in the studio, you know, just playing around, uh, did the drums, you know, just some really steady drums, uh, the bass, you know, deconstructed all that, and I was able to get pretty close. <laughs> the singing is kind of embarrassing, but uh, even that was uh, a lot better than I expected. I, I did uh, at least a chorus, you know, but. It's for sax, and I, I hope you, I hope you dig it. And um, we got to get upset about things, you know. I think the real abominations in life are a matter of taste, and some people have taste, and some people don't. You, my good audience, have taste. I'm sure of it. But um, you know, when we get to that place where we're kind of crossing the line and getting on the edge a little bit, that's where it gets dangerous and exciting. And we can have good taste about it. And we can also make really interesting art. So I hope you enjoy a song that I'm about to perform for you. Sure know something. Hey, here in the studio working on a track from the Dynasty album with Kiss. Vince Ponzi did a great job. I'm trying to recreate it. So let's take a listen. I added something special. Freaking saxophone on a kiss album. enjoyed all that stuff down there hit it like subscribe it really helps the channel I appreciate it it's time for the music
they never told me in school, and I should.